Hey everybody, good to see you back again. Let's pick up right where we left off last time with getting a belt fitted to the first generation starting engine governor. Last time, of course, we covered the differences between the early governor housing and the later one, and respectively, there are different part numbers for the belt early to late because we have different ranges of adjustability between those early and late housings. So running both of those belt numbers, the early 2A4062 and the late 5B7168, both crossed to that Daco 17390 that we tried the first time and it didn't fit. They also both crossed to a Gates 9385. So we know there's differences in reality between those two cat belts but all the interchange manuals point us right to where we've already been. So I picked up the Gates 9385, and when you look at the specs for these belts, so the first one we tried is 0.53 inches wide. It's a little greater than half an inch, and it says 39.27 inches around. You look at the Gates, we're just under half an inch wide, 15 30 seconds. And even though it says it's only 38 and 7 eighths inches long, a narrower belt is going to go deeper into these grooves on the pulleys and might actually give us like a greater distance covered. So over a wider belt that's going to be riding shallower in those pulleys and it's going to have to be a lot longer to span the same distance. And while I was at the parts store, I popped for another Gates 9395. It's still half inch wide, but we're an inch longer at 39 and 7 eighths. So we're discounting the Deco for now and we're going to try these two gates belts see if we can't make something work. So cutting right to the chase, the first belt I tried was the longer of the two new belts that I just brought home. And when I set everything in place, I found that even bottoming out the existing slots I have in the governor housing still left me too loose. My next option which I didn't like, but I could do, would be to add shims beneath the governor base and the top cover to actually raise the governor up. I could get proper tension that way, but by raising it, oh, probably another 3 16ths of an inch, that's about as far up as I could go, as far out as I could go, and if this belt ran in and loosened up any more at all, I'd still be too loose. So I decided the longer of the two gates belts is a no-go. So that brings us back to that Gates 9385. The number that the original cross-reference said should fit this application. So I looped it on the flywheel and I set the governor in place and I found that it was still just a little bit too short. It was better than that very first belt that I tried, but I just still needed a little bit more adjustability. So I hate having to do this, but I did it anyway. I took a round file and I added about an eighth inch more slot to each one of those openings. That's all I needed to make this just barely fit, but it does. So getting everything in place, I was able to tighten the governor down. I've got excellent belt tension. The pulleys are perfectly in line with one another, so we're tracking straight and true. We finally found our workable solution. So with the governor finally put to bed, we can move on with the rest of the buildup. Exhaust comes next. Got two new gaskets for it and even sourced the original brass hardware. Holds it down to the top cover. And this exhaust is the textbook definition of old school right here. This was before they realized they were giving away a significant amount of heat energy by just letting that starting engine exhaust blast off into the atmosphere. A couple years after this tractor was built, they did redesign the diesel engine intake manifold. They added a heating jacket around this intake runner and they piped that starting engine exhaust into that jacket so it could surround and warm this runner a little bit and they would scavenge a little bit of that heat energy and circulate it through the upper end of the engine during cranking. It did help them start a little bit quicker, but in 1947, when they did away with the old D3400 and went to the D311, there were some major redesigns in the cylinder head area. It relocated the intake manifold to this side of the head, 
and they oversized the manifold and they ran the starting engine exhaust through what amounts to a hot tube that went through the center of that intake manifold and that way they could capture 100% of the radiant heat that was coming off that tube and circulate it through the diesel engine. I bring this up because once you understand like all of these changes and the design process and the evolution that these went through, you can see where we started on the path that led us to the modern day glow plug, introducing as many different heat sources into the combustion chamber of a diesel engine as possible to get it to fire off quicker. Which in turn leads us to this rather interesting little piece right back here. You know, I don't usually do upgrades to first generation stuff, but this is one that's so cool and it's so hard to find anymore. I just have to use it on this build. So you can see it didn't come into effect until serial number 5J1820. You can see right there, there's an exhaust flapper on the end of that pipe. All the tractors prior to that just had it wide open. So we're gonna put this on the build. Uh, it's not only cool, but it's also functional in the fact that it keeps unwanted pests from crawling down this starting engine exhaust pipe when it's not in operation. And it just clamps on the end of the pipe. And then when the engine starts, the exhaust pressure pops that cap open. You got the spring on the pivot right here. So it over centers that spring. It holds itself open. And then you just have to remember to come back here and they put that little tab on the edge for your finger. So you just close it back up again, good to go. So once again, Thanks for that, John. Really cool piece to have. It's carburetor time now, and I'll give you guys a, one bit of advice. It pays to pull both of these base studs out and check to make sure the metal has not heaved around the bolt holes. I had to do that to this one as well, and I've had other ones that have had that happen too. And you need to be careful when you throw the gasket on, always check and see how the carburetor base mates up to it because if you have material that's been pulled up around both of those studs, you will find you get a lot of rocking going on that that base is not flat down against the top cover. And if you tighten bolts down or the nuts down anyway, you stand a good chance of cracking one or both of these ears off. I've seen it a lot of times and sure enough, I pulled both these studs. I had probably a 30 second worth of material raised up around there. It was enough that even the gasket was not going to put the carburetor base above it. So. That's just one bit of advice that I wanted to pass along. The governor linkage gets hooked up to the throttle plate now. Just uses this really long pin. And of course, a small cotter pin keeps it in place. The next piece now is the breather assembly for the starting engine. And this was a piece we didn't get with 1113 because you remember something landed on top of this, broke that old carburetor throttle body right off at the base. And I don't know if it completely destroyed the old breather or not. We only found one piece of that and that's the old crossover tube right here you can see it's bent and dented and it's salvageable but i did have another first generation d2 starting engine breather assembly on hand this is an original piece of 1113 otherwise everything else right here i had to source from my archives and this is another first generation what i call caterpillar jewelry piece that is constructed a lot like this early first gen breather on the side of the diesel engine. Lots of brass and bronze and cast, and it's just a really, really neat setup. To assemble it, we'll start with the base piece and this brass rod that threads into it. Next, we throw a gasket down at the base and then the breather can. It's an element with some perforated screens in. Goes on top. Next is this beautiful bronze top piece. Just the casting and the machining and everything that went into that. I just can't believe they ever did things that required that much to be put into them, but we have another gasket that goes on there. 
and then it goes on top of the breather can like that. And then this nut goes on the top, holds it all together. Followed by another gasket and then the cap that says oil here. And there it is. And for an explanation of how this breather works, I threw together this quick sketch. So pretend you cut this thing right down the center and you were looking straight into the side of it. That's what we have right here. So where the cap says oil here, you remove that and you add the engine oil down the pipe that goes all the way through the breather can and threads into the base. So that's what these arrows are. That's the engine oil being poured in. And when it gets into the base, it's gonna hit the bottom, but then there's this raised lip right here. It's a little wall that prevents it from running down into the sump. It actually directs it over to the hole in the bottom, and that's where the oil makes its way into the top of the starting engine. So then you're running the starting engine and crankcase vapor is going to come back up through the hole that the oil ran through and it's gonna try and come up that pipe, but it's not gonna be able to make it out because the cap's gonna be on at that point. So the pressure is going to then go past this little dam right here and it's going to swirl around the sump and make its way through a channel here where it can get into the breather can that has all those perforated screens and it can swirl around that center pipe and do whatever it wants. All those screens will separate out any liquid. That liquid will then condense and come back down and run down into the sump down here where it can be drained off periodically out of that pipe plug. And the rest of the vapors will continue on up through the top of the breather can and they'll make their way out the hole. Well, we got it on the side, the hole on the side right there where they're going to enter that crossover tube. Crossover tube feeds that elbow. Elbow is bolted to the top of the carburetor. So the vapors are then recirculated back through the engine and burned up again. So it seems a little bit complicated, slightly over-engineered, but that's why I love this first generation stuff. They eventually just did away from maintenance items like this as the design levels changed, but I love these early pieces. All right, crossover tube is next, followed by the inlet elbow for the carburetor. A few more pieces and we've cleared another bench full of stuff. It goes fast, so the way the crossover tube works, springs go on each end of it, and then you'll have a metal washer, and then an O-ring. This is a CAT 3B8453, still available new. So the metal washer goes between the spring and the O-ring, do the same thing for each side of it. Another thing I did was put some slick stuff on those O-rings. It's gonna help you out quite a bit if you lubricate them a little bit. So the O-rings just push into the top of the breather and the top of the elbow. The springs compress and self-center and the elbow, the elbow, sorry, bolts to the top of the carburetor. And that brings us to the end of another one, but we didn't do too bad today. We got the governor sorted out. Exhaust is on with our flapper. We've got that early first generation breather with the drain off spigot and the crossover tube. Carburetor's in place. Inlet elbow is in place on top of that. The next thing we need to do is fill this void right here. That is magneto. And once we get the magneto sorted, I can start working on the throttle and choke rods and the little control panel. Whatever landed on this tractor and broke the carburetor and deleted the breather also did a number on these rods. So there's a lot of fixing and straightening to be done. That shouldn't be shaped the way it is, but they pass so close to the magneto, that's gonna have to be in place before I can do the final fitting on these. So yeah, it's, um, it's really coming together and that's just a, Kind of another example of how many parts and pieces they put into these early Caterpillar tractors. And remember this D2 is the smallest one in the lineup and it only got bigger 
and more of it from this point on all the way up on through d8 so yeah those uh those boys in the the drafting room were quite busy i think back in the day so all right everybody thanks once again for watching magneto's up next